Hello everybody, Pokemon Trainer Rob here, and welcome back to the Pokemon Emerald Battle Frontier. We are now more than halfway done with these challenges, and so far we're on a nice gold symbol hot streak. However, that streak is going to be putting us to the ultimate test, because today we have the Battle Palace. Honestly, of all the challenges here at the resort, this was quite easily the one I was dreading the most. Just because this one is perhaps one of the largest margins of luck you'll be dealing with. Not only will you face the same general progression as all the challenges so far, the three versus three battles, seven battles in a round, opponents and opponent Pokemon randomized with the exception of the Frontier Brain, but the battles in this place are set up like the battle tent in Verdant Turf Town, where you pretty much sit on the sidelines during the fights and the Pokemon in combat are left to their own devices. They pick the moves, and the only thing you can do is potentially switch out if you think a matchup will not be worth it. Aside from that, you have no control over what happens in these matchups, which means this mode is extremely luck-based. Now, the moves your Pokémon choose to use have a slight dependency on your Pokémon's nature. Moves are classified into three types, Attack, Defense, and Support and each nature has a different ratio or percentage of likeliness of what type of move they'll be selecting. Unfortunately, a majority of my team are pretty much 100% attacking moves, and while that seems like that should be a good thing, it's not. You see, whenever a Pokemon lands on a type of move to use, if it doesn't have that type of move available, it'll just not attack at all, and you will lose a turn in the process. Pretty much like a turn of loafing around with a Slaw King, for example. And even if you have a heavy attacking nature with 100% attacking moves, that's still no guarantee, and it still might land on the defense or support move instead. You really need to have a diverse moveset for this mode. If you don't, you're going to have a really hard time here. Also, keep in mind, even if your Pokemon does manage to land an attack successfully, they might still pick a move that's not very effective, or not the strongest move at your disposal anyway. So, it's still a bit of a crapshoot, even if you normally have an optimal move pool. Now, there are some small semblances of breathing room to be had here. For one, your opponents can and will get screwed over by the mechanics of this place too, so it's not entirely stacked against you. Also, much like the Battle Factory, you only need to make it through three rounds for the Silver Symbol and six rounds for the Gold Symbol, which means only 21 and 42 fights, respectively. So, it's within the realm of possibility, to be sure. But, if you guys know anything about me from my tirades against luck-based scenarios in Mario Party games, you can probably tell that I did not enjoy myself very much with this challenge. So... Before we get started, there is one thing I'm going to address and reveal for the sake of full transparency and clarity. Based on everything I've mentioned in regards to the Battle Palace, was I as successful here as I was in the other four Battle Frontier challenges? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, sorry for the early spoilers, but there was no way in hell I was going to get as lucky or as fortunate here as I was for the other buildings. The Battle Frontier is already extremely rough and unpredictable, and when you throw in even more luck-based scenarios, when I have a team of some large weaknesses as it is, there was no way this was happening legitimately. I got through round one alright because all the Pokemon there are weak and not as IV trained as later rounds, but in as early as round two, I was already having some bad luck with the move selections and I experienced my first unintentional loss and broken streak. Meaning, there was no way in hell I was going to accomplish this with my current team and move setup. And at this point, I don't really want to make changes to my team or their move sets, so yeah, this is technically where my hot streak ends. However, because this is a let's play and I do want to cover this place to the same extent I covered the other challenges, this is what I'm going to do. Since I am doing this playthrough on emulator, I am going to be using save states at the end of every round. This way, I don't have to keep starting over from the very beginning if I lose, and I can still at the very least show the general journey and process for obtaining all the symbols. 
I know this may not seem very authentic, and some of you will see this as cheating, and that's fine. I don't disagree with you on that point, but that's why I'm calling attention to this now, and essentially putting a giant asterisk on my run to show that this was not done 100% legitimately. I at least want to see if it's possible though with what I have, and that's why I'm even bothering with this video in the first place, instead of just making a short and underwhelming video with not much content or progress, and just moving on after the fact. This way, this mode gets at least the same respect of coverage as any of the other establishments in the Battle Frontier. As I said before, there is not much to be said about round number one. The Pokemon are weak, and my all-star lineup of Kip, Sig, and Slavko are once again the main MVPs here. In fact, I pretty much exclusively used them and used them all in the same order for every single round. Unfortunately, they're all three 100% attacking moves, which did cause some problems here and there with skip turns, but for the most part, I'm not complaining too much about their work overall. Although, I do have to give Slavko a small finger wag of disappointment, because I did find him missing more often than the other two, and when Slavko already has a turn of loafing around as it is, that could be a bit of a large hindrance. When he did hit though, it was usually decisive, so he was still clutch when it mattered the most. I think his nature just had a lower attacking ratio than both Sig and Kip, but that's just the way this mode works. Let's go ahead and skip on over to round number 2, battle number 8 overall, as round number 1 was free even with my struggles. This match starts with Kip versus Pidgeot. The Pidgeot uses Feather Dance to harshly lower my attack power, but thankfully Kip has the sense not to use a physical move, not to mention it wouldn't deal damage anyway since it's a ground move. Ice Beam and Muddy Water take it down. Next up is Plusle, and we see how effective the previous Feather Dances were, as Super Effective Earthquake does about half damage. Kip follows it up with Muddy Water, getting a critical hit, and knocking out the Electric-type Rodent. Last up is Linoon, and despite it lowering my accuracy and paralyzing me, two Muddy Waters and a very unnecessary Earthquake take it down and takes the match. Now, as you can see, Kip is still doing extremely well here at the Battle Frontier. In fact, I actually found out off recording that Swampert is probably one of the best choices for these types of challenges just because of his bulk and his type coverage with his only weakness really being grass types. Battle number 11 continues to show his excellence as he one-shots an Aeron, a Trapinch, and a Diglett. Moving on to battle 14, we start with a Venomoth. Kip earthquakes it, and despite the bug having wings, it's not part flying, so we do get some nice damage in, although not enough to KO. Kip then gets an Ice Beam and takes it down, bringing in Parasect. We get some questionable move choices by Kip, but we eventually get it down to under half HP before it changes its strategy to Spore, a sleep move that never misses. With Kip out of commission for the moment, and the fear of this Pokemon having a grass move, I opt to switch over to Slavko, and after a long period of nothing happening and Parasect regaining lots of HP, Slavko finally hits with Slash, and then finally an Aerial Ace to knock it out. Last up is Ariados, but a Hyper Beam one-shots it, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Battle number 15 puts Kip right back on display as he two shots a Swallow with Ice Beam and Surf, then proceeds to one-shot a Matang. Last up is Girafferig, and despite putting on heavy damage with Psychic and being able to take an Earthquake, it decides to use Agility on its next move, giving me another Open Door Earthquake to win the match. Battle number 18 starts out with Kip against the Mighty Enna, that manages to lower my attack with Intimidate and do some damage with Frustration and Crunch. However, two Muddy Waters are enough to KO and bring out Pupitar. Pupitar goes down to Surf, and now we have the special take Chansey on our hands. Now, considering we only have one physical attack, and the fact that our attack power is lowered from the earlier Intimidate, and the fact that Chansey has leftovers, this face-off is going to be stalled out for a bit. But, since I still have my two strongest physical attackers in reserves, I'm not really worried here. Kip eventually goes down, and Sig comes out to Brick Break to victory. Okay guys, it's time for the Frontier Brain, and today we have to do battle with Spencer, the Battle Palace Maven. Spencer's three Pokemon are Crobat, Lapras, and Slacking. And at first, I was actually kind of worried about this battle, 
as those are some pretty strong opponents. But here's how the battle went. Crobat confuses Kip, and Kip does unfortunately take damage as a result, but manages to hang in there and even breaks through a double team to land both Ice Beam and Muddy Water. At this point, Spencer switches over to Lapras. Lapras also tries to use Confuse Strats, and more than that, also attempts to get me with Horn Drill, a very low accuracy attack, but an attack that will one-hit KO any Pokemon it hits. Thankfully, it misses, and after a couple of Earthquakes, the Lapras goes down, and I still have about half of my health left. Crobat poisons me, and then starts using Fly to avoid my attacks. This combined with a few skipped turns leads to Kip going down, and me bringing out Slavko in retaliation. Crobat keeps using Fly, and I just spam Fight until he finally gets the opening he needs. Eventually, a Slash lands, and then we're off to Slacking versus Slacking. Now, funnily enough, Slavko doesn't need to win this fight, as I do have Sig waiting with Brick Breaks just in case things go wrong. However, this Slacking actually gives me a golden opportunity when it decides to use Swagger, a move that increases my attack power at the cost of Confusion as well. This makes it so if I break through the Confusion, I'll actually be doing quite a bit of damage, and this Slacking does it twice. When I finally get a chance to attack, Confusion doesn't work, and I charge forward with a Double Swagger plus Stab Slash, which one-shots the enemy loaf and gives me my Battle Palace symbol, the Spirit Symbol. Although I wasn't happy about the fact that I had to use some exploits to get this symbol, it does feel good knowing that it is still definitely possible with my team and my movesets. I would just need to have all the battles roll out in the same way they did here, but imagining the odds of that is not a very pleasing thought, and I would not want to wish that pain on anyone else either. But let's see how the rest of the journey would have gone if I decided to get my gold symbol. Battle number 22 is actually kind of funny. Kip double earthquakes both Banette and Sneasel to death, only taking two defense drops and an aerial ace on their way out the door to bring in the last Pokemon, Sharpedo. I guess in some strange poetic justice though, Sharpedo decides to use an Earthquake too and knocks out my Swampert. However, my Brick Breakin' Breloom, wow, try to say that three times fast, is on standby and one-shots the Sharpedo. Moving on to battle number 25, we're up against Nidoqueen, and after an Earthquake, the Royal Beast is still standing and unfortunately has counter to her moveset, which means Kip is unfortunately down for the counts. Even though there is a slight typing disadvantage, I still bring in Sig next, and one Sludge Bomb is all I need to even up the score. Arcanine comes up next, and there is no way I'm staying in with Sig here, so I switch over to Slavko. Slav eventually uses Thunderbolt, kind of a weird move choice honestly, but before we can do any more damage, the canine retreats to the bench, and we're now up against Anita King. Although I'm sure he's not happy with what we did to his wife earlier, one Hyper Beam is all we need to make sure he wouldn't carry out his revenge. This brings Arcanine back to the field, and eventually we finally get the opening we need to finish this fight before we even need to bring Sig back into the equation. Match 28 in the final battle of round 4 starts with Kip against a Flareon, and Earthquake is all we need here. Next up, the trainer decides to bring in a Snorlax, and 1, 2, 3, 4... Both Pokemon declare an Earthquake War. And while we are witnessing two beasts of bulk at war, Snorlax has just enough the defense to hang on and win this battle of attrition. Oh well, at least Sig can jump right in and finish off what's left with a simple attack. Slacking is last, and dang, there's been a lot of slacking encounters in here I've noticed. Anyway, since slacking is kind of bulky, this fight does ultimately take a while. And to be honest, I'm not even confident Sig will be able to last to the end, just due to the random attack choices and the enemy leftovers healing whatever damage I do meanwhile. However, this battle shows me that I need to have a little more faith in my Pokemon, because despite coming close to being KO'd, Sig does hang in there and clutch out the finish before I even need to bring Slavko in. Starting with the penultimate round before the final round, we have Kip up against the Tauros. Unfortunately, Tauros has Intimidate, so this weakens the power of Earthquake. However, Kip is smart enough to use his water moves instead, and does manage to take out the normal type in two attacking rounds, getting heavily damaged by Thrash in the process. Executor comes in next and starts charging up a Solar Beam. 
This is actually great for me because it does give me a chance to win before it even attacks, but two ice beams aren't quite enough to KO and Kip easily goes down once the solar beam lands. I quickly bring in Sig to KO and bring out the final Pokemon, Pinsir. Sig helps me breathe a nice sigh of relief when she uses Sludge Bomb and poisons the enemy bug. Until the bug decides to use Guillotine, a one-hit KO move like Horn Drill that takes out Sig and worries me for the final encounter. Because if it uses it again, it's back to the drawing board. However, Slavko is smart, and Pinsir is surprisingly dumb here. It decides to use Endure, and Slavko decides to use Aerial Ace. Aerial Ace is quad effective, and would have probably KO'd Pinsir here. So, while Endure was smart for that reason, remember, Pinsir is also poisoned, so Endure leaves Pinsir with 1 HP, which is immediately knocked out via the status condition. Now, I think Endure has priority, so I'm not entirely sure if Pinsir was faster than Slavko or not, but still, I feel like a chance on Guillotine would have probably been the better move here, but who's to say really? What happened happened. Match 32 closes with another very questionable enemy decision. To start though, we have Kip against a Dugtrio. After missing an initial Muddy Water, we get the second one and knock the Pokemon out. Second up is Fortress, and it's pretty bulky. So bulky that it takes multiple earthquakes and a few double-edged recoils to take it down. But still, we are victorious. Last up is Hypno, and although I am able to get a nice earthquake against it, it decides to put me to sleep. Fearing a Dream Eater, I decide to switch over to Slavko, and here is where I start encountering my bad luck with my Superstar Loaf. I do get an Aerial Ace in, but I am unable to attack for the rest of the face-off and Hypno is just landing Psychic after Psychic after Psychic on me. Now, kudos to Slav here, he does tank 3 before ultimately going down to the 4th, but that really should have been an easy clear with him. Not liking my situation, I go ahead and bring in Sig, just on the off chance a Brick Break or Sludge Bomb can KO, just for her to use Solar Beam. However, Hypno decides to use Dream Eater, of all moves, despite using Psychic four times before that, allowing me to get my attack in and finish it off before it smartens up. See, even enemies face the nuances of this particular mode. The last fight of this round goes a lot faster. Kip earthquakes and one-shots the opening lantern, Dodrio comes in and uses Steel Wing, I use Ice Beam, and then it finishes me off with Double Edge which also does enough recoil damage to KO itself as well. The last Pokemon is Golem, and for some reason I bring in Slavko? I mean, in the end it doesn't matter, Sig can easily one-shot Golem with quad effective grass moves, and even Brick Break should do fine, but I guess I just wanted to make sure that RNG didn't mess me up with picking the wrong moves or skipping my turn, so I assume that's why I brought in Slav first just to do some damage so I could get the Assured KO, but I still find that kind of unnecessary. Probably not my brightest move there. Just a few more battles to go as we start Round 6, Battle Number 36. Kip is up against a Mantine, and I make an executive call to switch over to Slavko. I have a feeling I'll be up against all Water types here, and I want to save Earthquakes for Pokemon that will be affected by them. Slav uses a Hyper Beam and knocks it out in one shot. Next up comes Waylord, and Hydro Pump is dealing some heavy damage to my Loaf. I do get a Thunderbolt in, so we do get some heavy damage on this monster wannabe, but Slav does indeed go down here. I bring in Sig to finish up the Whale, and all we have left now is Sea King. We get a nice Sludge Bomb to start, which even poisons our foe, and then we also neutral resist the Mega Horn that follows. Thank you, Fighting Dual Type. However, Sig once again decides to go for Solar Beam instead of another move, meaning we will be a sitting duck for a turn, and Sea King decides to use another horn move, Horn Drill, which does connect and one-shots her to KO. This somewhat easy fight once again starts to make me nervous, because moves like this can be very easy run-enders, even when you theoretically should have the advantage otherwise and Kip will be just as vulnerable to the attack as Sig was. 
However, thankfully, the attack misses and we get the Earthquake to finish off the fight in our favor. The last fight we'll show before our rematch with Spencer starts with Kip against the Jinx. Jinx decides to start with Parish Song, and I decide to open with Earthquake, giving us a very easy HP advantage from the jump. Knowing I still have another turn before I absolutely need to switch out, I decide to stay in and see what my opponent does in retaliation. It goes for the switch into Parasect, and Kip unfortunately uses Muddy Water, not doing very much damage. I decide to switch over, just in case it decides to use Giga Drain, and bring in Slavko instead. After a pretty weak draining of Slav's HP, Slav unleashes a Hyper Beam and pretty much one-shots the bug, bringing in another bug known as Armaldo. Slav decides to use everything but Hyper Beam, and Armaldo stays focused on damaging me, ultimately being the winner of this face-off. Sig comes in, and although she does do decent damage to put it into the red, a critical hit Iron Tail, followed by a skip turn, knocks out Sig as well, meaning Kip is my last option here, and I still have Jinx left from his other team. Thankfully, Armaldo just needs an Ice Beam, and Jinx just needs a Surf to take them both out in quick succession. Also, I'm pretty thankful Jinx didn't use Mean Look at the beginning of this fight, because it did have that move as an option to force me into Parish Slon KO. Oh well, I guess we lucked out again. At the end of round 6, we're back to rematching Spencer. And this time, the Palace Maven decided to keep his slacking, while also adding Arcanine and Suicune as very powerful backup numbers. Kip starts up against Arcanine, and despite having the advantage in a multitude of ways, it still takes two Earthquake hits to KO Arcanine. And of course, this doggo has extreme speed, so we take some heavy damage on his way out the door. Slacking comes in next and KOs Kip with Shadow Ball. I bring in Sig, and although I do get a Brick Break in, Slacking naturally uses Hyper Beam, so Sig is one shot in retaliation. It's now Slacking versus Slacking, as Slav comes in and gets the Revenge KO with his own Hyper Beam. Last up is Suicune, and it's looking like it only needs three Surfs to KO. I Loaf, it Surfs. I Hyper Beam, it Surfs. I loaf again, and then it uses Blizzard? Well, Blizzard should still KO, but thankfully due to its low accuracy, it misses its mark and I have my chance at victory. I hope for another Hyper Beam, but instead my slacking lands on Slash. But it crits, which means I am the winner and I have obtained my fifth gold symbol. Kinda. Yeah, I won't celebrate too much here. As I already established earlier in the video, I did have save states backing me up just so I didn't have to start from the very beginning if I lost or got an unlucky break. However, I only made save states at the start of every round, not every battle. So I still had to make it through seven battles in a row before I even got to use one of my self-imposed checkpoints. Which is still quite an accomplishment, because these fights are seriously hard. Having no control over what move your Pokemon will use, and having some turns where you just might not attack at all, was a real pain in the butt to deal with, and this was easily my least favorite challenge of the entire Battle Frontier as a result. I do kind of like the idea though, but the skip turn mechanic was seriously a big misstep in my eyes, as far as this challenge is concerned. If that was removed, maybe I'd be a little more on board with it, but whatever. I'm just glad it's over now. And with that, we are just two more challenges away from finishing the Battle Frontier and this Pokemon Emerald project. Now, I'm not sure if I'll use the same save state manipulation or exploit that I used in this video for the last two challenges. I honestly still have to record them and see how difficult they end up being. But if I do, I'll probably just do it in the same manner I did for this video. Where if I do, it will only be at the beginning of each round, just so I don't have to start back from round number one every single time I lose. But until I record those videos, we'll just have to wait and see if it comes to that. Anyway, next time we'll look at the Battle Pike. This has been Pokemon Trainer Rob. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Later, folks.